I want to thank you for joining us in this episode of Real Talk. In just a second, I'm going to give you my uh, assessment of Tucker Carlson live in Edmonton. I uh, was there in the house with about, uh, I'd say, about eight to 10,000 other people. Uh, it was a, a busy day for the once shining star of Fox News, uh, arguably the most prominent conservative commentator uh, in the world, uh, the right wing uh, of course, uh, what do you want to call him? Not a prophet. That might be a little bit much, but Tucker Carlson's following is obviously massive uh, to the point where he was driving Fox News into that number one spot on cable news networks Tell he wasn't. You know the story. He got fired. He took his show to X, to Twitter, and, well, his traveling road show uh, drew thousands and thousands of Albertans in both Calgary and and Edmonton, both events attended by Alberta's premier. There were some developments as well. You knew that Conrad Black was to be there. He was the founder of the National Post, Lord Conrad Black. You know that Rex Murphy was supposed to be there, the the, the longtime pundit. He was not, and his substitute uh, got people pretty excited as well. And then kind of the who's who of Canada's Right wing in the house. Theron Flurry was there, but didn't take the stage. Uh, Tucker Carlson introduced by John Carpe from the, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. You know, John, back in the day, he's the one that compared the pride flag to the swastika. And then there was all the fallout from that. I mean, everywhere you looked, there were characters. I understand that's a loaded word, and I use it intentionally. There were some people that were there that were severely normal, as Alberta's former Premier Ralph Klein might describe them. And then there were people there that are obviously bonkers, uh, like you get at a lot of events like this. I was keeping an eye on it, like one does, maybe like in an airport arrivals or departures lounge, any mm-hmm. great place for people watching. Uh, when Jordan Peterson took the stage, in he was the substitute for Rex Murphy. I'm people guessing he crazy. got a huge, yeah. Well, I think that most people would probably trade uh, Rex Murphy to get Jordan Peterson anyway, so I think it was an upgrade for the event. Nobody knows why Rex Murphy wasn't there, but I digress. So I'm going to get to that in just a second, and then I love this from, from real talkers like Kyle and Aaron, uh, also in the house there that night, and they sent us their thoughts too. So I want to get into it. Uh, We're going to be taking a look at a a, a video that was allegedly released by the alleged shooter at Edmonton's City Hall. He was identified by police. He's facing serious charges. Uh, this video is probably not one that you're going to see or hear on the on the mainstream news networks uh, for obvious reasons. Police have not verified the identity of the person. Police have not verified the validity of the video, but it provides some interesting insight into why this person maybe did what they did. And, and the video is all over the map. We're going to get to it in just a second. And then we'll turn our eye to the sports world, in a way. But it's sort of everyday life uh, blending in. Of course, you know probably, if you pay even moderate attention to the news cycle, what's happening with members, uh, five of them at this point of Canada's 2018 World Junior Hockey Championship team, the World Junior team, as we call it in Canada. Five of them, uh, four playing in the National Hockey League, or at least they were, and one of them playing over in Europe, have requested leave from their teams. Is it coincidence that the London, police uh, have reportedly ordered five hockey players, five members of that team to surrender uh, to police to be charged with sexual assault? Probably not. Uh, We're going to talk to a guy who does what we do in the sports world. He's an entrepreneur uh, and he's a great storyteller as well and and a great broadcaster. Dustin Nielsen will join us. Dusty, the founder of Edmonton Sports Talk. He's uh, the voice of the Spangler Cup. He's the voice of the CFL on TSN. Uh, a good friend of ours personally, a good mm-hmm. friend of the show. Uh, I see so, him at the Elks games doing the CFL broadcast. That's right, yeah, man. He called guy. the Grey Cup on radio this yeah. year. I'm so proud of that guy. Yeah. And then also we'll talk about um, this may be flying under your radar, unless maybe you're a hockey parent or, or whatever, but I think everybody could be interested in what's happening with the Alberta Junior Hockey League, the AJHL. Yeah. So there's five teams that have said that they're leaving. Uh, they're going to go to the BC Hockey League because they're doing things differently in BC. BC basically broke away from Hockey Canada. They're doing their own thing. And these five Alberta teams say, well, next season we're going to play with them. Well, the AJHL finds out about it and suspends these teams. And and basically at this point, at the time that we're talking to you, these teams are having all their games canceled. So who's getting screwed? The players, the fans. So Dusty's going to make some sense of that for us all before the show's over. Before we get into it, before I start sharing a few thoughts on, on the whole Tucker Carlson show, uh, I wanted to let you know that this show is made possible with the support of Business Career College. And I know that there are people out there that are looking for rewarding and high-paying careers without university degrees. Hey, a great option is getting started as an insurance professional with Business Career College. 
in Canada, insurance agents are making great salaries. A lot of them are starting over 60 grand a year. You're soon up around 90. You get into the six figures. Again, without a university degree, all you need to do is take an approved course and pass your licensing exam. So BCC, that's Business Career College, offers uh, approved courses in life insurance, property and casualty insurance. Their expert instructors super passionate about making sure that you succeed, that you reach your goals and launch your new career. Right now, there's a great offer for Real Talkers if you use the promo code Real Talk. One word uh, on their website, you're going to save 15% off any insurance course at businesscareercollege.com. That's the promo code Real Talk. All one word at businesscareercollege.com. I got two questions. Okay, go. Number one, how did you get those amazing seats last night? Yeah, and number bad. two. Did anyone recognize you last night inside Rogers Place? Yeah, lots of people. And yeah. uh, it was great. Uh, snapped some photos, had some fun. Mm. Um, ha- had somebody come up to me jokingly. Remember I said on the show yesterday, if you see me, because uh, <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit incognito, but not totally. Yeah. I said, if you see me on the concourse and if there's not big lineups, if you quote our hashtag, I'll buy you a beer. Did it happen? Uh, had a couple guys come up nice. and, and, and cite it and laugh, but they were already double fisting, so they mm. were good. I, I appreciated <laughs> that. And then had one other guy come up and a uh, shout out to Brock and, and cite the hashtag, uh, however, unfortunately, they had already done last call. Oh, okay. So he got, he got my fist pound and a promise to, to bring him up here into the studio and get into the beer fridge well, at least once. Props so. to you for not over-serving customers. That's right. It's that, a bartender that, that, that trait was my that number, you That carry. was my number one concern. <laughs> uh, but yeah, interesting to see. And I think a lot of people were interested to see how this Tucker Carlson event would go. Back-to-back events in, in Calgary and Edmonton. Calgary for lunch. Uh, Edmonton. Uh, in the evening, and so uh, we walked over there. You know, it's just across the street, our studio right across from yeah, Rogers' right place. So, so uh, walked across the street, and and you had like you know, sort of walking in. There was like you know, folks flying the big Freedom Convoy flags. I walked in. One of the first flags I saw, I tweeted about it. Um, in the house, in the arena, was a big Trump twenty twenty four flag. Yeah, and, I heard and the horns elicited. Yeah, lots At of like horns. Six thirty last night. Lots of people sort of cheering with the Trump stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you saw a few American flags. That stuff kind of drives me nuts. But I, but I understand why. And I've got relatives sure. in the states, and we love. The state so it's great but you understand what i'm saying um and, and then like i said kind of the who's who so th- this uh, rachel emmanuel gal gets up she's from true north you know yeah. that that outlet that was founded by candace malcolm and them and this i'm talking about kind of name dropping the the who's who of the right wing in canada um rachel emmanuel also happens to be david parker's wife uh, the take back alberta founder that was on our show a couple of months ago so she comes up and um you know whether you like her perspective or not she had a couple real zingers out of the gates like um, what she she said uh she said uh, it, it, you know, Rachel Notley is, is so afraid that Tucker Carlson's coming to Alberta that she resigned. And uh, that, that got a pretty, uh, I laughed. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, there were, there were some good lines in there. There was obviously a, a very sort of a conservative friendly crowd. You know what you're getting into. And, and lots of people that were, like I said, just, I think, curious to see what one of the biggest media stars in the world sure. would do live and, and what he would have to say. Uh, so, so John Carpe introduces him and, and uh, Daniel Smith's up there as well. Uh, Smith takes the stage to just absolute raucous applause really standing ovation brings the house down she comes in uh, alberta's premier does and uh she she starts talking about freedom of speech and uh, not in the sense that she she had tweeted about i think um you know where she she was like you know everybody should be able to talk to everybody else and and free speech means having conversations with like check this out for example she tweets this photo from calgary uh yesterday uh says free speech means you don't just have to talk to the mainstream media I finished up in calgary off to edmonton next and there she is uh posing for a photo with uh psychologist and author jordan peterson <laughs> with tucker carlson and with conrad black founder of the national post what a photo uh, what a photo right uh look at the look at look at the uh, you know people go why did danielle smith do this why would she do this well i don't know million. let's take a look at the analytics on the tweet 1.2 million views uh 17 000 likes i mean th- this is her crowd and it's a friendly crowd um, so doing. so she gets up there and and um i think you know a lot of people there last night were wondering to see when the crazy would happen or what would be that moment where it just kind of went off the rails sure. and uh, spoiler alert there was not one of those moments okay there were some things that were said some of them were kind of like subtle subtle little things that were said where you went er 
But uh, but there was n- not sort of one moment where you went, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Alberta's premier comes in. She starts talking about, uh, you know, freedom of speech. She, she indicates that she believes that, that cancel culture is a problem in particular on university campuses. I think that a lot of people would probably share the premier's view uh, that there is not a, a robust or an environment of, of, of robust intellectual discovery or exploration on university campuses as much as there should be. Um, so I don't think that that's a particularly controversial statement. She talks talked about how uh, Stephen Gilbo, she really wanted Tucker Carlson, she said, to shine a light on Stephen Gilbo, uh, and he didn't either. Mm. But boy, did he have a lot to say about the federal liberals. Uh, not a lot about Gilbo, but boy, that guy does not like Justin Trudeau nor Christian Freeland. I'll tell you that much. Did he call uh, him a dictator? <laughs> oh, pff, that was the <laughs> nicest thing he called him. Smith talks a little bit about how they want to... You know, they, uh, Gibo, the feds, Ottawa, want Alberta to dial back its oil and gas production. She says, we're going to double it. The crowd goes nuts. Uh, and then, you know, she shares a few more thoughts about why she thinks that the event is important and, and then concedes the stage for John Carpe. John Carpe introduces Tucker Carlson and all hell breaks loose. People go nuts. Uh, the guy is obviously a very dynamic speaker. He's extremely talented. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's very funny. Uh, he's he an had, entertainer. He had the crowd absolutely eating out of his hand. He said some curious things. And what, like, here's one example. Um, and people say, well, what's the context or what's the whatever? But I'm, I'm just giving you a little example example so he said something like you'll have to pardon me i'm very polite he said i'm an anglo as an anglo in my nature it is an anglo it's in my nature to be polite okay. and you kind of go okay hang on a second what does that mean there were like these little tiny little comments but he he was firing on all cylinders taking aim at the federal government calling justin trudeau a creep calling him a cross-dressing freak Whoa. calling him a communist dictator Jeez. wondering when he's moving back to cuba he says <laughs> if i was canadian he divulged last night by by the way, that his father's family is from Nova Scotia or spent time in Nova Scotia. So he said he did have, he does have some Canadian blood, but he said, if I'm Canadian, I don't know about you, but I'm running Trudeau's name through the 23andMe website that, that figures out your ancestry of the crowd goes wild. Of course, this whole thing around the, the conspiracy theory that Justin Trudeau is, is actually Fidel Castro's love child. You, <laughs> you, you know that whole story, right? Um, Carlson spent some time uh, talking about trans people, which was Ooh. probably the most... Uh, pointed and 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 I don't know if I want to use the word venomous but it it was probably the most like full guns blazing attack mode that he went into but he spent a very short period of time talking about what it What did he say? Uh, he he said that he's never met a trans person that has actually been happy uh, after, in, in oh, his words, and the, the way that he put it, sort of a self-initiated castration, right? Mm-hmm. And like genital mutilation is how he referred to it. People would call it gender transition surgery, mm-hmm. or gender reassignment surgery. Uh, but 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 the trans thing kind of landed with the crowd in a way that, that, that I found some people that had been applauding big time throughout kind of were reserving their applause and other people were going nuts about it mm-hmm. because that's kind of, I think, you know, part of what they were expecting to hear and wanting to hear. He spent a ton of time talking about the Alberta relationship with Ottawa. Sure. I bet that people, uh, a lot of the people were surprised, or maybe not, uh, at his his depth of commentary on what's happening in Canadian politics. Like, he was hitting on so many things, um, and this is the mark of a good speech writer, and this is the mark of a great performer. Do you think uh, he has people who help him? Oh, I'm sure he yeah, does. Like, I, write I, his stuff? I, I'd be curious to know. Uh, certainly when he had his show, he would have had speech writers. Yeah. He's, he's obviously a very intelligent person. Um, I was talking to, to a journalist that was there last night, and she said to me, the thing I can't wrap my mind around it is that he's this, like, this, this right-wing icon that dresses kind of like a left wing mm-hmm. Ivy League preppy she Bow said he, he's and- so very cool <laughs> he's so very critical of the Ivy League schools from where he graduated mm-hmm. she was trying to wrap her mind around his presentation which is obviously very curated you know he had his like navy blazer on with his khaki pants Always. his signature striped tie that's the Tucker Carlson look um, and uh, yeah, yeah just obviously you know talked about how he thought that uh, you know the, the feds how the the, uh, the uh, you know the Trudeau government the liberal government in Canada he said it's just an embarrassment mm-hmm. and he said and we know 
what happens with governments like this is ultimately the people rise up and remove them from power. And people loved comments like that, statements like that. He talked about Justin Trudeau's blackface uh, several times. Obviously, the crowd loved that stuff. But he really, really uh, had 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 hand grenades reserved for Christia Freeland. Uh, Talked about how he knew her back when she was a journalist for the Financial Times. He said that that he said that publication will forever have to own the embarrassment of once employing her. She thinks she's much smarter than she is. He Hmm. called her a fascist midget. Uh, The crowd (laughs) went nuts when Tucker Carlson referred to Canada's deputy prime minister as a fascist midget. Um, But I mean, had people, uh, like I said, uh, on the edge of their seats, uh, delivered a keynote for probably about a half an hour. And then that was it. Welcome to the stage for the panel. Jordan Peterson and Conrad Black. And then the three of them chewed the fat. Uh, d- depending on who you talk to on that panel, I felt like it, it, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to hear someone like Jordan Peterson in person. Um, he, he, he was very ethereal. He was very sort of, I mean, Peterson kind of was retreating into his own thoughts, burying his, you know, he had his legs tightly crossed. He goes his, off. <laughs> he had his head kind of in his hands. Uh, it almost looked like he was, the wheels were turning and he was gathering himself before his next diatribe yeah. or his next statement. Um, Con- Red Black kind of waxing poetic. Black is up there uh, in his own words as the biggest Trump supporter in Canada. Uh, he says, I have a track record of proving that I am the biggest Trump supporter in Canada. Went on to say, uh, did the founder of the National Post, uh, Lord Black, that it's probably because I've known Trump, he says, for 25 years. And when I ran into my own legal trouble, said Conrad Black, mm-hmm. uh, he said, most of my wealthy friends or my friends with influence developed amnesia and forgot my phone number. He said, <laughs> Donald Trump did not. Wow. Uh, but Conrad Black really got into kind of the, the election denialism, talking about how ballots, you know, millions of ballots were dropped off in the middle of the night, uh, you know, on the side of the road beside post offices and people started booing and this kind of stuff. Uh, that, that wasn't something that Carlson really latched mm-hmm. onto, uh, which I thought was interesting. But but all in, like, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, you know, I would say eight to 10,000 people hearing from, you know, some of the most prominent conservatives in the world. So uh, it wasn't full. Prominent right wingers in the world. What's that? It wasn't full sold out. Uh, well, I, I don't think that they opened. They wouldn't have opened the upper deck. So okay. if you picture a hockey arena, if you want to put that photo up that I snapped on my phone again, like a fisheye photo for people I listening see, on the podcast, out. you can see. I mean, the upper deck is blacked out, but the entire lower bowl and the floor was full. Uh, but, I mean, that's that's a hell of a turnout for mm-hmm. for something that's not hockey or a rock concert um i I did hear and and tucker carlson to his credit man during the show gave a shout out to the people who showed up for the free tickets and then this kind of this whole (laughs) area yeah this whole area started cheering which i thought was interesting like he he just was like yeah a lot of you know that so you know they got it to full uh because they gave away some free tickets which i i liked the transparency there um but i think most of the people there were were paid uh, ticket goers. I mean, I didn't mm-hmm. get any sense to, I mean, and, and that's not a surprise that a guy like Tucker Carlson no. could sell out a 10,000 seat arena. Especially um, here in Alberta. Yeah. I had uh, I, I, I had uh, uh, an inkling that we would hear from some real talkers that were there, and I'm glad that, that Aaron and Kyle took us up on our offer uh, to pass along their thoughts. Aaron says, other than my disappointment that Rex Murphy was not there, uh, she says, I really wanted to hear his ridiculous out loud. Um, that was the greatest thing she said, seeing Tucker Carlson. She says, here's my uneducated, uncouth synopsis go easy on yourself Aaron Um, oh here's something that Aaron touches on something that Daniel Smith said twice from Mm -hmm. the podium that I thought was interesting Um, she congratulated uh, Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee she specifically recognized him and I thought she was going to say for quick action with the shooting Mm -hmm. at Edmonton City Hall right like this is like 28 hours after that happened maybe 30 hours after that happened but no She was congratulating him and his officers on swift action with the homeless encampments in Edmonton. But that's not what she called them. The premier had a name for it, obviously a formulated strategic name for these encampments. And and I'll give it to Erin because she writes in in her email. She says, what was up with Danielle Smith talking about gang operated drug camps? Um, that was the four words that, and I even text, you know, I text things to myself, Johnny, so I don't forget them on the show. I texted that to myself when she said it, gang operated drug camps. Um, it has been alleged, uh, by credible people to us, uh, to politicians, to other, you know, uh, people of record, uh, in Alberta, that there are gang operated homeless encampments that, that cartels are running some of these camps and some terrible things are happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that to be true. 
Um, I think that characterizing them as gang operated uh, across the board may not be accurate, but I think that that is a fair play for a politician that's trying to make a point. Calling them drug camps, I think, is is troublesome yeah. uh, because it's obviously misrepresenting what a lot of people are experiencing there and why a lot of people are there. Yeah, they're uh, not churning uh, out drugs. It, they're addicted to and, drugs. And, and it's not a camp established for people to go do drugs. They're not there to replace a supervised consumption no. site. It's not all drug users there. Uh, we heard from, you know, we remember when we talked to Brandy Morin, the journalist, uh, I think it was about a week ago, two weeks ago, when she was arrested. Uh, she gave us an exclusive interview. You can find it in our archives no longer than two weeks ago. Brandy told us that there's an entire indigenous camp uh that was dry uh an entire indigenous camp that mm-hmm. was being run by a by a gentleman and by an elder uh that that is has been living a life of sobriety for many many years and that was the tone that they had set in that camp but i'll get back to aaron's email she says what was up with smith and the gang operated drug camps um she says she said it two or three times and then says bless the police then john carpe comes on from the, the, the Center Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms and basically says, like, fuck the police, uh, which he did, um, in the context of, like, Christian pastors being arrested and all this kind of stuff, right? Jordan Peterson's message says Aaron was basically walked toward Catholicism. Um, there, there was a lot of sort of theological, uh, psychological musing from who you might expect it to be from, Jordan Peterson. She says Tucker came across as reasonable and rational for, like, a minute until he realized that that wasn't what paid his bills she said i was also struck by his assertion that safe supply means that we are feeding young people fentanyl in canada Mm. Uh, he really really sunk his teeth into that he he talked about how how canada is basically giving fentanyl to children without the knowledge of their parents Uh, people start booing and and i'm sitting there going that's not true at all (laughs) um and then he started talking about made he started bringing up medical assistance and dying and and talking about how the federal government is basically using it for population control uh he talked about supply and demand and how the fewer votes you have the more valuable the votes are and medical assistance and dying is being extended to people simply because they're sad or because they're destitute not because they're they're in pain and hey there are some concerns around medical assistance and dying there are some concerns on how people uh with mental health challenges are accessing that system or why some people in desperation, including poverty, may be looking to medical assistance in dying. We should not simply flush that argument away. But of course, he took it all the way to the max. Mm -hmm. And that made an impression on Aaron as well, so much so that she wrote it into her email. And then she says, Conrad Black was my favorite. Uh, Massive, deep cut disses to his two comrades on stage. He doesn't mince words. He was the most honest of all of them. For instance, when he said that when he was in legal trouble, uh, Trump didn't lose his number. She said, and maybe the greatest spectacle, the fact that CBC called him a Nazi. She says, because that's totally true. Aaron says, I'm looking forward to your synopsis on the show. And then we heard from Kyle. <clears throat> I wondered if Kyle was the big bearded fella in the Carhartt coat that came up to me about three feet away and just took my picture right to my face. That's it? I, I, didn't, uh, I just thought that one, that was, that was the one that I was like, I didn't know if he wanted a picture with me. I didn't know if he was like, I was like, that one was kind of a weird one. Did he say but, anything? No, he didn't say anything. He just walked up and took it. And I thought, I wonder if that's Kyle. Because Kyle had sent us an email saying, I'm going to find you at the event he says i want to shake your hand this guy didn't shake my hand but kyle says i kyle says i saw you there but i didn't come say hi um he said i don't know if my takes will differ from you or not he said but i was a little surprised that conrad black was the only one pushing election denialism on stage and the only one thinking that trump will cakewalk to win that election in 2024 carlson tucker carlson said he thinks that the 2024 presidential election is still up in the air he also wondered whether or not and this is kind of interesting too he suggested He didn't say it. He did not say it, but he implied and suggested that the Democrats might do something to get rid of. He used the word sinister. The Democrats might do something sinister to make sure that Joe Biden is not their candidate for the next election. So that was an interesting comment he made Uh, back to Kyle's email. He says, I think it's ludicrous uh, to think this, uh, that, that, that Trump will cakewalk to election. He says, most people know that it'll be tight come November. But to say that the show wasn't great. Uh, with his wacky old grandpa vibes wouldn't be true. He said that maybe the only part of tonight I didn't like is because I like Nikki Haley and I see Biden beating Trump. He said, I liked optimistic takes on how human life has never been better with under 10% of the world's population being in global poverty. Um, How with America's backing, the West won the Cold War to provide more opportunity. Kyle says, well, the True North speaker 
uh, and and the lawyer, John Carpe, were rallying the troops with their speeches. I loved Tucker Carlson's. He didn't come across as radical. Uh, it was funny, yet honest and truthful. It was funny. I agree with you, Kyle. He says he was there all night with his signature laugh. His laugh is just wild. And quips like mispronouncing Canadian cities. He went on and he talked. Remember that time? It was a few years ago. Tucker Carlson on Fox talked about the Canadian capital of Ottawa. Yeah. And then everybody was like, Tucker Carlson doesn't even know how to pronounce it. He goes, so he goes, so here's the thing. Tucker says, I love mispronouncing Canadian cities and it just drives people crazy. It just drives them nuts. He does it all Drives the time. them crazy. He says, until an Algonquin elder reached out to him with an email and said, you know, it actually is pronounced Ottawa. He said an Algonquin. So Tucker Carlson takes this opportunity to say your prime minister loves dressing up in other cultures costumes, but he doesn't even understand them. And then, of course, the crowd loved that as well. Uh, Kyle says his whole speech and tone was emblematic of what right of center people face and see with the risks of our current direction. He did not come across as far right like his critics say. He seemed normal. Um, I don't know about normal, but he explained why liberals are scared of him. He did. He said, and it's also cool to note that he's uh, half Canadian, being from Nova Scotia. We can call him the Maritime Ted Cruz. Kyle says the Premier, Daniel Smith, had a beautiful speech, very well written. Uh, it was kind of an Alberta versus the detractors speech and the policy that she's implemented. It was really empowering to hear how we need to secure the freedom of thought and ideas and to be able to share them freely and openly. It's, it's how we push forward through times of divisiveness. Uh, and I really see her becoming more Premier-like. And the polling reflects that, that from Kyle. He says, Jordan Peterson was good. He was way too Judeo-Christian in the psychology of it, sort of the Anglo-Christianity versus trans, the sort of the fear of God and, and those who think that they are God commit genocide. He goes, it was getting a little heavy, uh, but a lot of his points in the macro sphere would stand if the world was so binary, but it's not. He says, but he did make a good point that humans 50 years from now will advance more than humans advanced over the past 200 and with the technology being developed, the margin of error decreases where utopia is in reach, but a few points away is a dystopia. Hmm. Uh, Kyle says, all in all, a little too much Americana Trumpist at the end, but understandable. Uh, it was definitely a Trudeau, Freeland, Gibo, NDP shitpost party, uh, but overall it was pretty good. And Jespo, I hope you enjoyed it. He says, sorry for the long email. How Canadian of me apologizing. Nice. Um, I don't, it wasn't an, I, I, the only, yeah, I mean, great email, Kyle, great email, uh, Aaron, thank you. I don't think that it was an NDP shit post. Nobody talked about the NDP except for Rachel mm -hmm. uh, Emanuel at the very beginning with her Rachel Notley joke, which I thought was really funny. Um, that, that's, that's not relevant at this point. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of this is Alberta v. Ottawa, of Alberta versus the federal government. Sure. Right. And and Tucker was talking about, you know, and I'll wrap up my thoughts here. He, he talked a, a little bit about how Canadian cities don't have identities based on what they contribute to the country. He says, whereas in the United States, he says, you know that all the decisions are made in Los Angeles and New York and Washington, D.C. You know what those cities are all about. When you think of Pittsburgh, you know exactly what that city's all about. When you think of the state of Nebraska, you immediately think of what it contributes to the nation. He said, you don't have that in Toronto. Mm -hmm. He said, Toronto is built on banking and real estate. He said, and I don't think that that's a real or viable economy. He said, societies throughout history have not required or have not relied on commercial real estate and banking. He says, but Alberta is all about energy and food. He said, and you cannot function without energy and food. And he said, so you have a jurisdiction. He's talking about the federal government or you have, you know, a group that basically contributes nothing. I mean, this is his supercharged language, obviously. But he says, telling a jurisdiction that gives the country everything mm -hmm. how to operate and the place goes crazy. Of course. You know, obviously, <laughs> obviously a very pro-Alberta crowd. Obviously, I am pro-Alberta. Uh, but, but it was, you know, that was kind of the tone of it. There wasn't yeah. a lot of, like, UCP versus NDP. Car Tucker Carlson's not getting in the weeds on the NDP leadership race. I mean, that, not no. a chance. That, that's not even on his radar. Not at all. Uh, but but yeah, so that was kind of what what jumped out at me. Well, he knows what he's doing, and I said this before. I I think at the heart of it, he he's an entertainer, and and I do believe this though. I believe you know he talks about all these things: closed borders, conservatism, you know, infiltrating leadership in every corner of North America and the globe. But I don't I don't really believe he wants that because what's made him a hundred millionaire, Ryan, is the chaos. And if the chaos goes away. There's not much to talk about, especially on Carl uh, Carlson's uh, Twitter show. So I, I don't I don't in my heart believe that he really wants things to get better. And at, at, the, at the at the base of it, he's just an entertainer. He's someone who pushes buttons and he makes a lot of money doing it. And whether you agree with that or not, I mean, you could I'll just say right now, you could get on your show tomorrow and say a bunch of crazy things and 
we know these numbers and mo- monetary when, would go when through we the launched roof, but real talk morality we could have a million like, subscribers if yeah. we started talking about how the you know the chemtrails and the vaccines are yeah. killing people but you got to go to bed every and, night with sure. that you know uh, I, I i will say i mean he is and i know i've said it before and people are gonna go gosh you don't need to say it a hundred times to watch that guy work i mean myself as a broadcaster mm. myself as an event host a keynote speaker go this guy is very good at what he does mm-hmm. like he's probably the best public speaker i've ever witnessed personally um so it, that that was it let us know what you think to talk at ryan jesperson.com um tracy's absolutely correct i mean you know i mean there's lots of stuff i'm missing obviously i you know we were there for two hours but tracy says the premier defended the coots for uh and, and and says how is this not a bigger deal she did she, she talked about how what was the exact word talked about basically how it was unfortunate suggested that justice was being denied uh for those four that was an interesting statement on stage tracy you're absolutely right uh she says you know the premier is supposed to be about everybody and this is uh smith uh projecting her personal uh, tin hat crap which hurts a lot of albertans i don't know about that i i, I think when you're the premier of a pro when you're the mayor the premier the prime minister ministers uh city councilors uh, school board trustees you, you can choose what you want to attend and what you don't and you can set your own schedule and uh, like it or not daniel smith has earned the right to attend that event and if you look at you know where a politician uh, cares where their popularity comes from unless it's months ahead of an election they care about their base and their supporters um, and and yes you've got to govern the entire province there is no doubt about that but but uh, as we heard in in that robust debate last week here on the show um, you know with with uh, Matthew and Peter going back and forth uh, Peter Hayes uh, Peter McCaffrey rather and Matthew Hayes uh, you know debating whether or not the premier should be on stage with Tucker Carlson at the end of the day I understand, as a former colleague of hers, exactly why she's doing it. She's doing it because Tucker Carlson's one of the biggest stars in the world, because the exposure is massive, and because she's speaking to her people. So there's no doubt about it. Um, I can also guarantee you that her team of inner senior advisors probably did not want her to do it and probably didn't think that it was a great idea. By the way, no W. Brett Wilson on stage in Edmonton. I don't know about Calgary. I think he was on stage in Calgary. And while Theo Fleury got a shout out as uh, Dr. Dwayne Bratt, the political scientist, uh, chirped at me on Twitter, which I thought was really funny. Uh, probably the only time that Theo Fleury has ever been cheered at Rogers Place or in a hockey arena in Edmonton. But big cheers for Theo Fleury last night, but they did not put him up on stage, which I thought was interesting as well. Um, Dusty Nielsen, in just a second, we're going to talk some hockey. Those five players requesting leave from their pro teams, all of them members of the 2018 World Junior Team. And then, what the hell's going on with the Alberta Junior Hockey League, the AJHL? It might seem like a niche story, but this is a big one. These conversations are happening with the support of Real Talk sponsors like our friends at Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food. They want to let you know that they got herring back in stock, whole herring which is a great side snack or integrated into your pup's raw or kibble bowls because of the omega-3 that is found in fish like herring. It's great in your pup's diet to manage inflammation and support their immune system. You can get it in 10 or 30 pound options and they've also got probiotics on sale through the month of January. Just go to the shop now link. One of the cool things about the probiotics, uh, Four Leaf Rover and Adored Beast probiotics, 10% off. They're good for dogs and cats. Yeah, that's right. Though they are Grand Dog Essentials. They've also got raw food for your cats and there's a ton of reasons why you want to check it out. Learn a little bit more about the benefits of feeding your dog or cat raw at granddog.ca. Don't forget, they'll deliver to your door in Calgary, Edmonton, and Central Alberta. If you're more concerned right now about feeding your family and budget is your number one concern, our friends at Friesen Brothers have a couple things they want you to keep in mind. Number one, the first of the month, February 1st, it's coming up. That means it's 15% off all grocery purchases of $75 or more. That's a huge deal, 15% off for families. And then there's the flyers. They've got their family essentials flyer. You can see it online, Friesen.com, or view it in store. Great suggestions on wonderful meals for your family, food that's going to be affordable, nutritious, and the kids are going to love it. All of it, those family essentials flyers, the recipes link, and more online at Friesen.com. Our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy want to remind you that they're hiring right now. They know that people aren't thinking about solar installation in the middle of the winter with, you know, I don't know, 30 centimeters of snow on your roof. But that doesn't mean they're not getting people ready to hit the ground running in spring. And their engineers are drawing up plans for installations all through the winter months. If you're an engineer, an apprentice, a journeyman, if you're a sales professional, an office manager, you'd love to live and work in Kamloops, Calgary, Edmonton, or Lethbridge, Check out the careers link today at kubienergy.ca. 
And if it's time to treat yourself with a little bit more organization at home, you promised yourself you'd get decluttered, but you've not made good on it yet, why not take five minutes today to check out californiaclosets.ca. The consultation is free, so you've got nothing to lose, and nobody is going to do a better job of getting you organized and keeping your house looking better and better and better with every installation. For us, it was an entertainment center in our main room and a walk-in closet for Carrie. They did a beautiful job. Up next, we're hoping to hire them to do our garage. They do it all. Custom closets and storage solutions for your entire home at californiaclosets.ca. All right. Well, there's a lot going on in the hockey word, world, and, and while this isn't a sports show, these are stories that we're paying attention to. I think that most Canadians are. Now, you may not be aware of exactly what's happening with the Alberta Junior Hockey League, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Like five teams basically suspended the players paying the price for what the teams are hoping to do next year. And we'll get to Dustin Nielsen on that in just a second, but you probably saw over the past couple of days five professional hockey players, four of them in the NHL, requesting leave from their teams. Uh, None of the teams have said why, aside from the fact that they're personal reasons, and it's believed that these are five players, including Alex Formanton coming out of his pro league in Europe, that will be surrendering to London police to face charges of sexual assault. Dustin Nielsen is the founder and host of Edmonton Sports Talk. He's the play-by-play voice of the CFL and the Spangler Cup for TSN and a good friend of ours. Dusty, it's nice to see your face, pal. Hey, good to see you, Jess. Well, how are you doing, man? I'm, Thanks for do, having I'm me. doing very well. I said at the outset of our show this morning, when you were still doing yours, I said there's a, there, while well, you're sports and we're news, politics, and pop culture, there's a lot of similarity in what we're doing. Uh, a long history in, in mainstream media, you're out there now for, for a large part of your career going at it on your own as an independent. Been doing it for, for several months now. How are you liking it? Uh, we love it, man. Like, it's, it's great. We've got an office on the West End. You're running shows live on YouTube from six to one. We've got like an online radio station feed, which does extremely well. So yeah, Edmonton Sports Talks, uh, you know, yeah, we're like five and a half months in. It feels like we've been doing this for quite some time. But, you know, we, you know, I had a buddy in Winnipeg who, when he got let go, started Winnipeg Sports Talk. Obviously, what you've been doing, yeah. seeing you have success with it. And some of the people in Vancouver, uh, when they got let go, you know, I mean, it's just where everybody's consuming content now is online. It's on your phone. It's wherever. Uh, so we, we thought we thought it would be successful. I was a little nervous, obviously, when we fired it up. But, uh, you know, five and a half months in, we think it's going to be sustainable for quite some time, which is exciting. Yeah, man. Well, you're, you're kicking ass. And, and I know the feeling of, of of having the rug pulled out from under you and uh, and sort of, you know, that nervousness around going it on your own. But you guys are killing it. And it's great to see your show well sponsored and well subscribed. And uh, and, and and I love that we can kind of lift each other up as well, man, and support each other. This is this is the new era of media, independent streaming on demand uh, audience building and 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 it's an exciting time um let's talk about this you had a, a great episode yesterday we watched it here uh where you were talking to actual legal experts i'm not gonna yeah. i'm not gonna put you in a tough spot and, and pretend like you're a lawyer but but obviously you're a you're a sports pundit uh, and a hockey pundit in particular uh you've got dylan dubay taking leave from the calgary flames you've got the philadelphia flyers star goaltender carter hart taking leave uh you've got cal foot and uh you've got michael McLeod taking leave from the New Jersey Devils and you got Alex Formanton taking leave from his Swiss club all five of them of course teammates on the 2018 Canada World Junior Team the assumption is obviously dust that these are the five players that will be reporting to London police and will be charged with sexual assault we don't know that yet yeah. uh, but people have been wondering about the names people have been wondering about details of this since this investigation got really serious yeah, it was interesting yesterday because Rick Westhead kind of had the you know, he started to tweet it out, and then moments later we had our legal analyst on, so it, it worked out very well for us. That you know he joins us every every Wednesday at seven forty five, and we usually don't have topics like the one that popped up yesterday to discuss. But Eric mcamally has been around the sports business uh, for a long time, and you know I take his word for a lot of it. And kind of asking him, you know, where did where does this go next? And you have to be very careful, obviously, just you know the stuff and and these legal type of situations, but. Um, you know, it's kind of been something that's been coming for a long time. Uh, the NHL teams would have known that I don't like this doesn't come out of any come out of nowhere. Alex Formanton had been playing over in Switzerland for the last two years because the Ottawa Senators didn't want to give him a contract. Yeah. 
because they knew that something like this was probably coming down the pipe at some point. So, uh, you know, the NHL would have known that this was coming. They dropped some news themselves yesterday on the uh, the expansion stuff. I don't know if that was a coincidence to take it away. It seems pretty weird that that would have come out at the same time. But, you know, Macromala, as he as he mentioned, you know, they're expected. He's he's expecting them once they turn themselves in, they'll be charged and then they'll go through the process. The one part of it that I wish I had a little bit more time to dive into with Macromala yesterday because he did bring it up is that London police looked into this in 2019 and basically said, no, OK, it's a it's a close close case right now um it has it has come back up apparently the victim is is willing to uh, cooperate here now in this situation so i don't know where this ends up going for these players um you know it's a much overall bigger conversation that we kind of had on the show a little bit today on on and just you know elite level sports and these athletes being put on a pedestal by adults uh parents and coaches allowing them to basically do whatever they want so they get to a spot in their life where they think they can do whatever they want. They basically don't know right from wrong because they haven't been raised properly. And then you find themselves in a situation like this. And, and now they're going to get whatever book is out there thrown at them. And we'll see how it sorts itself out and how it impacts the rest of the hockey world moving forward. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this tweet from the Beaverton uh, yesterday. Hockey Canada sexual assault scandal, a real shock to anyone who has never met a junior hockey player. Uh, so <laughs> that, that that goes to show how, how the, the general public is probably perceiving this. Now, obviously, there's there's a, a lot of upstanding hockey players that were raised the right way. Uh, they're yeah. not criminals that are going to be cannon fodder in this circumstance. But it obviously speaks to a bigger issue with hockey culture that we've been talking about, that shows like yours have been talking about for, for a long time now. When you talk about the Hockey Canada scandal, most people in the country know what you're talking about. Most people are aware that this is a an entity, an institution that's that's trying to turn itself around with a new CEO and a new board and and obviously a new focus. And that's and that's not resonating or landing well with everybody. And maybe we can get into that in just a little bit. What did you make of of the NHL rolling out that Salt Lake City? expansion process talk yesterday? It, 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 I, I don't I'm certainly not a conspiracy theorist. Like I think I'm pretty middle of the road, yeah. Uh, but it it struck me as kind of trying to bury the story of these five players taking leave. It, it I I saw it as a little I don't know it, it it rubbed me the wrong way. I know nobody like nobody's going to ever admit to that. But we had Dave Jamison in on one of our shows, The Hangout, yesterday, and Jamo handled PR for a long, long time, and he kind of rolled his eyes when he saw that you know, the National Hockey League, minutes after this news broke, was like, oh, but we're looking to expand. Everybody talk about expansion, which, to be honest with you, I don't know if anybody really wants expansion outside of the owners who want billions of dollars. Exactly. So, I mean, that's a, that's a classic, typical PR move. I mean, I'm not going to blame the National Hockey League for doing it. I'm sure their people were like, hey, we got to switch this conversation. That's It's a bad look. Because we all look at it and we kind of put two two together, um, so yeah, I mean it's it's disappointing. The, the whole, I mean, I don't know where you want to take this conversation, Jess. Well, I'm usually the guy asking the question, so I might kind of carry on the show. But it's it's like I said on my show this morning, man. It's it's this, and we had stories today coming in, and you see it. You're a parent, like you you get it. You have a young kid in sports, like you see it at such a young age. Where where parent, like to me, it's driven by adults who put who put basketball players and baseball players and obviously hockey is going to be in the spotlight here because that's what our nation cares about and hockey canada is a major you know major entity in this country and has had so much success for such a long time that when something like this happens it's going to fall in the spotlight and everybody's going to want to discuss it but i mean i look at it from a perspective of you know if you if you can shoot a three-pointer really well at a young age or you can do some of these things we had people today texting in being like he coaches u9 soccer they have to have a parent liaison there because some parents get carried away at u9 soccer because parents and adults and coaches put so much on these kids to have success that they can get away with whatever they want and then it leads to these types of situations so i mean this has to be handled properly you know for the victim and then we'll see how it trickle downs from there. But it's an overall discussion about elite level sports that I think needs to be had and has to start with adults, not these young kids who get thrown to the wolves when they're like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to be fair to you and I'm going to be f- and, and this show will have the integrity to, to reserve real discussion on, you know, the, the charges and the trial and the outcome and the implications because none of it's happened yet. I mean, it's pretty yeah. it's pretty obvious What's going on right now? It's pretty obvious. Anybody with half a brain understands what's going on right now. Alex Formanson's name has has been linked to this. For that matter, Carter Hart's name has been linked to this for 
for years, uh, for, for months and months and months at the very least, but we'll wait. I'm not going to ask you, Dusty, if you think that Carter Hart will ever play for the Flyers again uh, because I don't think that that's – I don't think you can give us an informed opinion right now. I would suggest that if they're convicted, they could do time, and it is possible that they'll never play pro hockey again. Johnny and I were talking about something. This really rubbed both of us – the wrong way, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think that this was a bullshit move from the Calgary Flames. Uh, their statement: the, the Flames were the only team that referenced mental health. Johnny, mm-hmm. they were the only team. The Flyers, yeah. the Devils, uh, and the Swiss Club stayed away from that. They yeah. simply said, "Our player requested absence. We've granted the absence." But the Flames took this further. Yeah, they said the team is giving him absence while he attends to his mental health. And I just think my immediate thought was. Oh, okay. He's got some problems, maybe addiction, whatever. And then you hear about all this stuff coming out. The one thing I thought was this does such a disservice to anyone now who comes out and says they have a mental health issue. They're automatically going to be painted as they did something wrong. Well, and and I just I just don't I don't know about how you feel about it, Dusty, but it's it's just not fair play. Uh, we got a note from somebody in our Instagram DM that, that said, "I hope you're going to talk about this tomorrow." And we did have you yeah. booked, and so I knew we would. Um, she said. When I first saw the announcement that Dylan Dubé was stepping away to tend to his mental health, she said, I thought, good for him. I hope he gets the help he deserves. And she said, and then as soon as I saw some more light shone on the story, now I hope he really gets what he deserves. Uh, I thought that was a bullshit move by the Flames. Yeah, I mean, the other teams, as much as you can handle this right, which, you know, from from an NHL PR perspective, from a team perspective, the Calgary Flames certainly didn't do that. You mentioned, you know, the other team saying, you know, I don't think we expect them to come out and be like, you know, Carter Hart's going to be away from the team because he has to go turn himself into London police. Of course. But for the Calgary Flames to come out and, 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 and now at the same time, I mean, is he dealing with some mental health stuff? Who knows? I mean, I don't want to jump to too many conclusions, but at the same time, now that it's come out that, you know, here's the, here's the group of guys, there's these five guys uh, from around the national hockey league and overseas who have stepped away at this time. I mean, it's not a good look from the Calgary Flames, um, assuming. Like, do we know exactly? Like, I think we've kind of come to terms with who the five guys are. I'm just wondering if there's like a sixth guy that pops up and all of a sudden Dubé isn't one of them. But I mean, it looks like it's going to be these five guys. And like you said, um, and you're being careful because you're a professional. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it is po- like, let's just but say. But I understand where you're coming from in the mental health thing. Like, like if, if, if that's what, if 100%. If that's what they claimed he was stepping away for, then that is very irresponsible in an era where, you know, especially, and I, I don't want to make this, you know, a man or woman thing, but especially in an era where we talk a lot about, you know, men are so worried about the mental health side of things and, oh, I want to be tough. And, you know, especially in like a hockey community, to use that as a crutch to try to sort of have this fly under the radar. And I'll, I'll be honest, it kind of worked. Now, I was busy with some family stuff over the weekend. But I wasn't even aware that Dubé had stepped away until I saw the Carter Hart news. And people were like, oh, it's happening with Dubé as well. And then right. you bring up the fact that they mentioned it as a mental health thing. And that may have helped it slide under the radar a little bit. So yeah. overall, not a great look. But let's be honest. I mean, in a situation like this, I mean, really, none of this is going to be handled properly or well. Yeah. A hundred percent here. Alyssa on our live chat says not to defend the flames, but if a player comes to you with like a doctor's note or whatever, you, you take it at face value, just like your employer would. And she's not wrong, but I, I just think I, I, I don't. And Alyssa, I'm not calling you naive. I just think yeah. it's I think it's a little naive to suggest that that a, a top six player, maybe top nine, top six player for the Flames is going to come to them and ask for an indefinite leave. And they're not going to have any questions whatsoever about what that might be about. I just, I don't think that that's how that works. I think it's different than working for the, you know, the Department of Fisheries where you go to your regional manager and and request time away. I think it's different. I would think with how much National Hockey League teams know about their players and their employees. Yeah. I mean, if Dubé came to them and said, hey, I'm going to need time off for this. And they were like, wow, really? We we had no idea. Like, yeah, there's, there's no way these guys don't know everything that's going on with all of their players. And I would think that, you know, in a HR or media relations perspective, if they felt as an organization they need to put a spin on it, it was probably a misstep in this situation. Um, but, I mean, it just, it, it, 
this just it's it's just going to get uglier and uglier and uglier before anything really gets sorted out. Yeah, um, you know, Tracy says the fact that Dubay was on the 2018 World Juniors team makes it obvious. However, if he is not one of the ones being asked to report to London Police, then the Flames could have clarified that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think for, for National Hockey League teams, for any sports organization, they just kind of they just kind of want to get like you, you see this all the time. It's like they're they're attending to family matters. We're giving them the time. They're stepping away. You know, we've seen it, I think, of Spencer Knight with the Florida Panthers. Uh, it's not everybody's business what the mental health challenges yeah. are that, that he's been dealing with. It's not the Florida Panthers' job to inform millions of fans what Spencer Knight may be wrestling with, as, as an example off the top of my head. Um, hey, go ahead, Dust. No, I was just going to say, it is funny how, like, with social media nowadays, we feel like we have the right to know everything. Yeah. <laughs> when, when really, I mean, in the end, it's, it's none of our business. Um we talk about these things for our work, but in the end, it's none of our business on a lot of this stuff. Now, when it gets into the, the legal issues that these guys are facing, obviously that's going to become a public forum. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, I don't know. I just I chuckle with social media quite a bit. Yeah, um, you and I were, were chatting about you coming on the show before this news broke. So I appreciate you taking that question. Obviously, it's something that, that millions of Canadians care about. But what I, I'm also particularly interested to hear your assessment and, and I, I think we're probably, when we talk about the Alberta Junior Hockey League, we'll start here and then we'll zoom out and then we'll zoom out again and then we'll zoom out again and again because there's big things happening all the way down to like minor hockey with seven and eight and nine-year-olds in this hockey super league. Uh, but but let's get into this. Uh, it's a story that, that junior and major junior hockey fans across the country are paying attention to. The Alberta Junior Hockey League is expecting major changes next season as five of its franchises and and four of its absolute top franchises are leaving to go to the BC Hockey League. The Black Falls Bulldogs, the Brooks Bandits, of course, uh, Kale McCarr, the greatest defenseman yep. in the modern era of the National Hockey League, an alum of Brooks, uh, the Okotoks Oilers, the Sherwood Park Crusaders, and the Spruce Grove Saints. As soon as the AJ found out about it, they basically suspended these teams midseason. What, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'll say my heart breaks a little bit because I got into the play-by-play -play business as an Alberta Junior Hockey League play-by-play -play man up in Fort McMurray. So oh, the oil always, barons. Yeah, for the oil barons. I had two years with oil barons up there and probably wouldn't get to where I was today without that opportunity. So I, I always had a soft spot for the Alberta Junior Hockey League. And then you, 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 you heard over the last little while that this was something that had been out there. It had kind of been rumored when the BCHL broke away from Hockey Canada you start to hear, well, you know, there might be a little bit of a merger here with the AJHL. And I always view the AJHL as a very strong junior league in this country. But this is a significant blow. Do I, like, I think they can still operate with the 11 teams that they have. The four, like four of the five teams, like you mentioned, now Spruce Grove has been a great team for a long time. They're not great this year. They're the first, second, third, and fourth place teams right now in the league are going to be heading to the BCHL next year. I saw one person, I think, on TikTok who was like, man, I love the Crusaders. It's going to be tough not to watch them. I'm like, they're not relocating. No. Like, they're still going to be playing in they're Sherwood Park. They're still going to have a chance to go watch them. Yeah. They're just going to be playing in the BCHL. So this is an overall bigger picture, but it is an absolute gut punch to the Alberta Junior Hockey League. I mean, can they find another franchise? And go with 12 teams. A 12 team league is absolutely fine. Heck, an 11 team league in this province will be fine if they can get the players to to uh, to commit uh, and and stay here and play in Alberta. But this is like from a business perspective, this is a clever play by the BCHL because you're not just going in and picking around the edges. No, you're grabbing the heart of the Alberta Junior Hockey League and ripping it out. Which if you're trying to take something over. That's probably the way to do it. That's you know, how you do it. Yeah, so let's tough. talk. So let's talk about why the BCHL, because this is going to cost these Alberta-based clubs more. Uh, their players are going to be traveling more. There's there's bigger implications. But the BCHL has been operating independently. They made that move. They they broke away. Talk to us about why that's significant. Yeah, I, it would be interesting to see if the AJHL, if these teams that left, were already kind of considering it prior to the BCHL breaking away from Hockey Canada and becoming an independent league. And then they see what happened after and the success that the league had. And, you know, the BCHL breaks away from Hockey Canada last year um, for a couple of different reasons. I mean, the one is the, the recruitment issues with the players. 
And, you know, some of the borders now the BCHL is an independent league can go and recruit kids out of Alberta and can go and recruit kids out of Saskatchewan and can recruit kids south of the border. And you, you, you more so than they were allowed to before. So I look at it from a BCL BCHL perspective, some of these top end teams in the Alberta junior hockey league. I mean, you want to continue to have success. You want to be able to offer your players the best opportunity here moving forward. And I've always kind of viewed it like I was, I was a big part of the Alberta junior hockey league, like 20 years ago or whatever it was. And the USHL south of the border was the league that kind of came almost out of nowhere and started to started to grab players and started to become like there's always the the CHL right the WHL the OHL and the Q they were always up here and then it was these these BCHL AJHL teams under here and then the USHL from a hockey development perspective kind of popped onto the scene and sort of surpassed the 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 junior A hockey model here and I think the BCHL had kind of seen enough of it and was like well we need to compete with the USHL down south for players and continue to develop these guys so they broke away from Hockey Canada and it's gone well enough that they managed to poach five teams from the Alberta Junior Hockey League I don't know where it starts they're up to 22 teams now I think that's a real nice competitive junior league and uh, you know the BCHL has been viewed as probably the best junior A league um, in Canada for quite some time. So if any league was going to make this move, it makes sense that it would be them. Okay, so there's this family. Now stick with us, Real Talkers, because Dustin's going to make this all make sense for everybody. <laughs> uh, there, There's these, as I understand it, brothers or this young family. They, they took over an HVAC business called Silent Air. Uh, I, my understanding is they're second generation. These are guys in their 40s. They're brilliant they basically my understanding is grew this business from like a, a you know a, a good business to like an unbelievable one and sold this eight it's a real alberta success story out of edmonton yeah, uh they sold it for something what does 900 million or something these brothers right in their 40s um and 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 they're they're huge hockey fan like hockey nuts and they've built this uh silent ice arena uh, i hosted a christmas party there i've have you skated out there in niscu uh, have, well i i went down and actually dude. called a couple i called a couple of the games at their winter championships for the JPHL. I, I picked up a couple of broadcast games. It is there. like so I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal facility. It, it, I, I said to people, yeah. imagine like if like Rick Moranis from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, if you just took Roger's place and just shrunk it down like a quarter of the size. But yeah. kept all the amenities, kept the beautiful installations. Like they have rink boards. I mean, it's a private facility, um, and it's absolutely stunning. And so this is kind of the home. And I and correct me where I'm wrong uh, of this hockey super league, the HSL. And parents with the means, because my understanding is it costs I don't know between five and ten grand a year for these young kids. Some of them are like eight, nine, ten years old, all the way up, are playing in the hockey super league, which means they're not playing for their community teams, right? And so a lot of the elite talent is being pulled out of these community programs. And some people are saying now that the, the HSL, this hockey super league has been around for a while. They're starting to see trends in like the Bantam drafts, like how WHL teams stock their cabinets, that all the kids are being drawn out of the hockey super league and it's hurting so-called community hockey. Then you take a look at these, brothers these successful guys the silent air guys they're also owners of a whl franchise now there's talk about a league running parallel to the whl what's going on man yeah i mean the lakel brothers are a phenomenal local success, success they're amazing there's no doubt about it yeah it, it's it's phenomenal um they own the spruce grove saints uh, one of the teams that'll be going out here to the bchl and, and with the jphl and the hsl you know it's basically a play against hockey canada which and now in this day and age, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to sit there and defend on the other on the other side of this thing. I mean, it, it's very interesting. And I my view on this so far is a little bit from a business perspective because I've called some of the JPHL games. It's an insanely well run minor hockey program. Like yeah. it, it just is. Uh, on the other side, you know, I'm I'm a father of two kids who play White Mud West hockey. For now, we're just kind of getting into it. Um, I haven't seen like the dark side of minor hockey in general yet. yet. I, I, I haven't <laughs> seen like for me so far, like my kid, my, my boy's a tier two kid in U9. He has a lot of fun. I know in tier one, there's been some stories where it's a little bit different. You know, we've, we've said since we were kids that politics get heavily involved here. So if you're a parent who doesn't like the politics of one side and you have a few bucks now, I, and I, I, I know like the HSL, you know, talking with people involved with that, they, they, they try to make it more affordable than some of these academies that are out there as well. So there are so many different levels and different ways to advance. Um, but the HSL and the JPHL 
have kind of burst on the scene and have the backing here and do things from a very professional perspective that I think would intrigue a lot of people. And in the end, you went back, back again, dialing it around from a parent's perspective. You know, it's, I think it would be nice to have options for your kids. I know, you know, people in the minor hockey system probably aren't going to say a lot of great things about the HSL and people in the HSL system are going to say, ah, you know, it was way better to break away from minor hockey. So it really depends on the experiences that these people have had, but in the end, it's just more options for our kids to play the game that they love. So I'm kind of torn on it because I haven't got to the stage yet where, you know, I'd make a decision on it for my kid or, or something along those lines. So yeah. Um, yeah, but I, it's a fascinating story, and it's it's a it's a major shift in the way a country that loves hockey is going to view the development path for the next 30, 40 years. Major, major. As far as you know, Dust, I'm maybe putting you on the spot a little bit, but is 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 any other jurisdiction, is any other province or territory is this happening there? Is this is this exclusive as far as we know right now to Alberta? I mean, I guess uh, the B, the BCHL example kind of applies here, but but with regards to development all the way up from U seven or U uh, nine, I I'm not an expert on the situation, yeah. but chatting with some of the guys around that Silent Ice group um, out in Ontario, the Christopher Steegs kind of running something similar uh. with uh, with these. You know, well, really, all it is like people have already always run independent hockey camps sure they're just taking independent hockey camps to a full new level right, right and just sort of expanding yeah. it like our kid you know my kids in power skating that's through an independent thing that's not through minor hockey so you know it's just a, it's just another option um and once again it kind of comes back around to the whole hockey canada discussion is that i just i hope we keep these kids level-headed no matter where they're playing well and there's um, a there's a really great point in here as well from yeah. sylvia who says like who will have uh, oversight for example of these organizations if they're not under hockey canada how can parents be assured that there's for example no abuse in these organizations uh, yeah and i don't want to come across as a cynic sylvia but, but i don't know if you can have confidence that there's great oversight when hockey canada is in charge either so uh you know based on recent track record but, but i mean that's a decent point as well like some people will believe that there does need to be one governing body for youth sport in a country right or in a province and and this certainly breaks away from that yeah and it does and I, i'm sure I, i'm not familiar enough with other sports yeah but you know how, how much how much is this happening in basketball how much is this happening in soccer and things along along those lines i i do know that the jphl which is like the older level the kids will play hsl and then they can graduate up to jphl and, and join those jphl teams like they have a full-blown full-time commissioner who runs the league. Like it's, it's not just a bunch of individual teams who are, are trying to put things together. Like it's all overseen under the commissioner and, you know, on the whole level of, I mean, I have a six and an eight year old. I'm only hopefully going to put them in hands of people I can trust. Yeah. So if, if you, if you get a bad feeling about a minor hockey coach or an HSL coach or whatever, that's on you as a parent to make the proper judgment and put your kids in these, in these right spots right now, what hockey is starting to provide you is different options to go about how you do it. And at this point in this whole discussion, I honestly think it's probably just a fair take to say that we don't know, you know, who the winner or losers are out of this just yet. Yeah. Hey, before we let you go, good question from Kathy, who wonders if the AJHL can't recruit more teams. Uh, could it join the SJHL, the Saskatchewan? Junior? I wonder if that might be an option. That'd be kind of interesting. Although what a story. I see me. My, my brain is wired with politics, Dusty. Alberta folding an organization to amalgamate into a Saskatchewan organization <laughs> is a tough look. <laughs> we view things on such a different level. I'm like, man, that would be a great idea. Um, <laughs> You know, then you could have like a, you know, like a, the Prairie Junior Hockey League. Why not? I mean, you could do that. It would, it would have to settle in likely behind the BCHL and the merger here, whatever that's going to be. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it all kind of depends, you know, what, what their role with Hockey Canada probably wants to be continuing. Like Okotoks was supposed to host the, the national championship and they're like, doesn't matter. We're leaving. So they obviously think that it's a better path. For their uh, for their players eventually and for their organization, so we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. The so, bottom line is junior hockey is awesome, so, so go support it no matter where it is. A hundred percent. And so, so we we can both agree though that as of right now, the, the 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 casualties here are the players on these five teams, right? Like as far as like, can I? And, and again, I'm only sort of understanding this on the surface, and I'm grateful if you're if you're just tuning in on the live streaming Mixler audio app presented by California Closets. We're talking to Edmonton Sports Talk host and founder Dustin Nielsen, a sports radio legend in the city of Edmonton <laughs> in the province of Alberta. Um, but but uh, so basically, though, it's it it strikes me as um, short sighted, immature, and malicious 
uh, for the Alberta Junior Hockey League to be suspending these five teams mid-season and screwing over the players and screwing over the fans. Like, am I missing something? Uh, no, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I'm torn on this one because if you're the Alberta Junior Hockey League teams who announced you're going mid-season, what did you expect to have happen? I mean, what's more childish? Announcing mid-season that, hey, see you later, we're out. Or the AJHL being like, what the heck's going on here? But did it you, leak you, you, or did they announce it? Uh, well, the AJHL, from my accounts, they might have known it was coming. Yeah. But they weren't told by the teams before the release that it was happening. Uh, so I could see why there would be some hard feelings they're pissed there. Off. You, you, you are right. You are right that the players are the ones who are going to take the hit here if they're not going to have an opportunity to, to, to play for a little stretch. Um, but to me, a lot of that falls on the teams putting themselves in this spot where that would be a possibility. Like you're kind of taking a risk here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why this wouldn't have just been announced at the end of the year. Yeah. Right. Like to me, I don't like, why would this have not just been announced at the end of somebody? The blew I don't, it. Yeah. I don't know why it had to come out when it did. I don't know what was accomplished and maybe I'm missing something behind the scenes, like some sort of regulations to get everybody in place for next year or something. I don't know. But it seemed the timing on this just it's something seemed fishy about it. Yeah. Uh, Dusty, thanks for doing this. I want to uh, and obviously you got to get back to work because the work never ends when you're running <laughs> your own gig. Maybe that's the beauty of it. Uh, I want to let people know if they want to learn more about what you do, including the Nielsen show uh, with, with your esteemed sidekick, Lieutenant Eric. They can check out Edmonton Sports dot uh, for Edmonton's best. What, what do you call it, by the way? We call uh, we, we don't call this talk radio for obvious reasons. We call ourselves yeah, yeah. a modern talk show because uh, you can stream us on YouTube. You can find us on podcast. You can stream us on Mixler. What do you what do you call? Well, we were kind of I mean, our slogan is uh, EST static free since 23. Nice. Which is kind of nice because, you know, there's no static anymore, which is great. Um, but like we're, 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 like we're on YouTube, but we're also we have an online 24 seven feed. That's great. Right. So you can listen to us on the tune in app with all the other radio stations. So we've kind of weaseled our way in there. So you can, and it does really well, actually. Our online stream feeds are very good. Like, those are really well. Isn't it's it going a, really well. So we're like an online sports station, basically. Isn't it a heck of a feeling when your new independent show does better than the radio show that you were hosting previously that you didn't it, own? It, isn't that it a It is kind of crazy, man. Like, we, we used to give away trips, like, when we used to work at 1260, and then that got taken away, like, four or five years ago. And this week we announced we're sending somebody to Vegas. Like, Unreal. With our own thing. It's like... It's amazing. It's 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 really I, you know what in the end it's just really exciting to see where this goes. More Love money, it. more beers, less leashes. <laughs> <laughs> more money, more beers, less leashes. That hey Dusty, and, and I got to say, I mean I, I know I texted this to you but I, I do just want to say it to your face. Um I can't tell you how proud I was to hear my pal's voice, uh you as the radio voice of the Grey Cup this year. Uh and then uh, over the course of the holidays uh, to be sitting there with my eight-year-old who just loves hockey on the couch and listen to you uh, calling the Spangler Cup out of Davos, Switzerland. Very, very cool, man. I'm proud of you. I look forward to the next time I see you in person. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jess. We'll appreciate the time, man. Thanks for the kind words. You got it, buddy. That's Dustin Nielsen. He's the founder and host at Edmonton Sports Talk. Dot com. Hey, I saw a lot of people t talking in the chat, just kind of reminiscing about whatever happened to the just the good old days of pond hockey, whatever, whatever happened to just taking hockey well. back to its roots and celebrating. <laughs> May I tell you about the Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic, of course, and this is not us hitting you up to register because we're thrilled that our third annual Pond Hockey Classic coming up on Saturday, February 3rd is sold out. We don't have room for any more teams. There's going to be 24 of them out there. Uh, I can't wait to meet the real talkers that are out there all in support of kids sport and uh, uncles and aunts at large but there is room lots of room for spectators who want to come here johnny infamous yeah. spin today's hottest tunes we're gonna have uh beers uh, courtesy of our friends at central social hall in molson we're gonna have burgers courtesy of our friends at the dqs of northwest edmonton and sherwood park of course lots of fun stuff for the kids the forecast johnny is like minus three or something perfect it's gonna be perfect sunny and minus three uh and uh, we invite you to come out it's larry Elect Lexiac Field in St. Albert. National Anthem at 9.30 on Saturday, February 3rd. Puck drop at 10. Goes through till about 3.30, 4 o'clock. We invite you to come by, say hello, 
and listen to, in my mind, what is one of the greatest sounds of all time, and that is a skate blade cutting Love natural it. ice. Um, we've got photos uh, that are uh, sent to us. Um, the, the city of St. Albert does an amazing job flooding Larry Alexiak Field for us. Oh, they, yeah. they have got their Zambonis out there. They're it's already done. it this morning. It's all yeah. done. It's a beautiful venue, and we're super excited about it. So that's the Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic, all for charity, coming up Saturday the 3rd of February. In just a second, we're going to get to a, a video that was allegedly released by the alleged City Hall shooter in Edmonton. Uh, but first, I want to let you know that these conversations don't happen without the support of Real Talk partners like our friends at Eden Landscaping that want to remind you about the importance of of a landscape architect, a landscape designer, and a construction crew that understands what's happening with climate and weather patterns. We saw through the summer drought and flooding, the two of them are related, making big messes across the country and around the world. Eden Landscaping is always watching the trends develop and the new technologies in landscape design and installation to ensure that your investment will stand the test of time, that your yard can weather the storm, so to speak. It'll impact the types of plants you put in. It'll impact your decision on turf, on drainage, on irrigation. You can learn more about the way they operate by checking out Eden Landscaping online at landscapeedmonton.ca. And speaking of those big weather events, if you're one of those families in the province of Alberta that's dealing with the aftermath of burst pipes after that big cold snap, you're going to want to get in touch with Complete Care Restoration. That's not the type of thing you want to mess around with. You know, you leave it for too long. Uh, number one, obviously, you got a mess on your hands. Number two, you black mold starts to set in. Complete Care Restoration has trained professionals that are certified in asbestos removal, black mold mitigation, and other important skill sets. Their number one thing, getting your property into their safe hands and back to the condition or better than it was before. They understand that it's overwhelming dealing with property damage. We recommend you trust the team at Complete Care Restoration. You know the story. Uh, January 23rd, uh, an armed gunman walks into Edmonton City Hall uh, wearing essentially a security guard uniform. It's, it's been confirmed by police that he was working as a security guard, but not at City Hall. Uh, he opens fire, uh, fires three shots, shattering glass. There are some unconfirmed reports that his gun jammed. He threw the gun down. He removed his jacket. He deploys a Molotov cocktail, starts a fire in Edmonton City Hall, which is quickly extinguished by uh, fast-thinking City Hall staffers, and he's ultimately detained by an unarmed security guard, a commissioner at City Hall, and arrested by police, now facing charges, uh, including careless use of a firearm, arson, uh, possession of incendiary devices, and otherwise. Uh, there's an Instagram account, uh, a really remarkable one, to be honest with you, regardless of how you feel about what Yegwave does and the information that they release. You can't deny they've built a following, Johnny, 300,000 followers yeah. for a local Instagram account is, is pretty remarkable. They released a video yesterday, which they claim was released by the alleged shooter. We're not going to play the entire video. I do have mixed feelings about media outlets releasing manifestos, but it does put into some light, some context on what may have driven this person to take this criminal action. Here's a clip. Before I do my mission, I want you all to know that I am not a psychopath. I do not believe in bloodshed. I am not one of this monster that hurt children, that hurt innocents and that promote wars or uh, the civilization of our society. I'm just tired of seeing the tyranny and corruption taking over our society and our lives. Um, good, honest, and God-fearing men and women must be our doctors, law enforcement, diplomats, politicians, and teachers that raise up, uh, rise up against this wokeism disease that's leading our generation into deception. We need good men and women in all workforces uh, to promote a pro-human life. We need to rise up against this uh, inflation, housing crisis, the unrest uh, that's happening between us because of multiculturalism due to religion, race, and all that stuff. This needs to come to an end with one another. Okay, so that's a portion of the video. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit all over the map. Uh, yeah. He, he talks about wokeism. Uh, yeah. he, he talks about uh, the, he, people need to be pro-human, which which reminds me of, of the David Parker theme, the Take Back Alberta guy, talks mm -hmm. a lot about what he believes to be 
anti-human government, anti-human trends, where you're wondering about what may inspire someone like this to commit yeah. the acts that they do. But he also talks about things, he, you know, he talks about multiculturalism. He's very critical yeah. of immigration. Now, I don't know this person's background, uh, no. but but it, it, it sort of strikes me as an unlikely person to be very critical of multiculturalism and immigration. And then he also goes on to talk about love and acceptance of everyone at the end of the video. And, and I was like, that's kind of against the wokeism thing you started out with but i, I don't know it's, he talks it's about very he, all over the place he talks about uh, people living outside their financial means he talks about getting people back onto healthy diets mm -hmm. he basically he touches on the obesity crisis like yeah. so so it's you know i've seen some people suggest and we don't know nobody knows nobody knows but this is just reality this is on the internet we're going to put it in front of you this is what real talk does we want you to stay informed and to know what's going on uh, some people are speculating you're wondering did this guy even write this yeah. Is this guy reading well, something that was written by someone else? We talk about this all the time, and I didn't want to say it because I don't want to make light of this situation. People could have died at City Hall the other day. 100%. But did this guy write this with AI? It seriously sounded like he put a bunch of topics into AI, and that's what AI does. It kind of doesn't get your point totally. And I feel like he started out with the wokeism thing, but then he went all over the place, and I, I don't really know what his underlying message was. Yeah, this from uh, Ken uh, in our live chat who says he is all over the map. I read an article where he was described as a salad bar extremist. Um, pretty good. Uh, Ken says the uh, different Ken. Uh, the algorithm is dripping from his words. Social media doing its thing again. Too many hours in front of the screen. Uh, Justin says this is another impressionable young mind warped by misinformation and the crazy echo chambers online. If I had to guess uh, that from Justin, who references the, and, and acknowledges that, that we don't know what drove this person. I think it's safe to suggest that that uh, uh, that if you watch the four minute video, that there's not a fulsome understanding of the issues. Uh, it strikes me as though he's recycling talking points that he hears from politicians, but you can't pin them down. You can't you, you can't say I mean, some people are saying, well, listen, that wokeism thing. That's Pierre Poliev right there. Right. Or the pro human anti human. That's take back Alberta right there. And there is some element of truth to that but i don't think you can tie this guy to a specific political movement only because this so-called manifesto is so okay it, 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 it's so erratic it's all over the and, place and and and, and things and, and like you said you know somebody sent me a, a dm um which I, i'll be honest and like you said it's not funny and there's yeah. nothing funny about this but it made me laugh where they were like peace and love and peace and love and peace and love and bullets and molotov cocktails yeah it you know, was it's, it's kind of a strange way to get your message across it was super weird and and just like you said like what i thought this was going to give us insight as to what his 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 point was what his message was we did not get this in this video basically we got he, he, it, we got an all over the place uh confused perception that this guy might have of reality and that's that's what i'm i'm chalking it up to i think most of these people that do these things have mental health issues depression i don't think they're people of sound mind and and i think we can tell that from the video yeah he's a 28 year old bejani sarvar uh, and he's facing six charges in connection with that shooting according to court documents uh including arson as i said possession of incendiary material careless use of a firearm use of a firearm while committing an offense and throwing explosives with the intent to cause harm. So no charge of attempted murder. Uh, no. Obviously, I believe that the Crown probably didn't believe that they could convict on that. And mm -hmm. and, and uh, you, you never like to see people charged with things where the Crown doesn't think they can convict. I'm not going to get too into this. But ba but basically, uh, you know, police and the Crown work together. You guys know how this works. And then the Crown will decide what they think they'll seek a conviction on. And so here you have it. They're, they're, they're not uh, light charges if there is such a thing. These are serious charges. Uh, but like you said, Johnny, and like I think most people are saying this could have been so much more serious. Uh, yeah. If you missed our conversations yesterday, exclusives with Edmonton Mayor Amarjeet Sohi and Edmonton City Councilor Tim Cartmel, both of them talking to us of their firsthand stories. The mayor about being whisked out of there, uh, which it sounds like he had mixed feelings about. I know that some people have been, let, let's just say it, uh, some people are being critical of Edmonton's mayor because he was not... Sure. Uh, he was not there. Uh, he, w he was removed from the premises by security uh, while a grade one class was still there, while his council colleagues were still there. Um, 
I would like to say uh, that, number one, that is typically not the decision of a politician. Uh, typically, if, a, if the president of the United States or a mayor or the premier uh, or someone is taken away, it is the security details choice. It is oftentimes against the wishes of the politician. Yeah. Uh, I understand the point that people are making, this whole idea. I mean, Councillor Cartmel to us said yesterday, talking about his own perspective and his own staff, he said, you know, kind of the captain goes down with the ship. He mm-hmm. said, I was worried about my own staff. Um, I have mixed feelings about that as well. Like, is it, is it the mayor's job to stay there uh, while there's a, a, an active shooter scenario, while there are still kids there? Or yeah. is it the mayor's job to listen to his security detail and GTFO? Uh, I, I, think, I think what the police and whoever got him out of there was doing was just thinking, uh, hey, it's a slow day. They're probably here for the mayor if they're here for anyone, which which is what I thought immediately when I heard that. But I do agree, like, I, our guest yesterday seemed really scared that no one was checking in with anyone else, right? Yeah. To say, are you are you guys good? Can we, can we put you somewhere? They just kind of, fire alarm, went into the fire escape, and then like our guest said... Didn't know what was going on. This isn't a fire. Do we, do we stay in the fire escape? Do we yeah. try to get out? Is this happening outside? Scary. So that's the January 24th episode, if you'd like to hear Mayor Sohi and Councillor Cartmel uh, talking about that. Before we sign off, and uh, what a fast-moving show, covering a lot of ground here, wanted to let you know that our friends at The Discourse, uh, it's already one of Canada's most downloaded political podcasts, which is fantastic news uh, for Erica Baroudis and for Cheryl Oates, you know, Cheryl, uh, a former director of communications for Premier Rachel Notley, Erica, the founding president of the United Conservative Party and former principal secretary for Premier Daniel Smith. So they come at issues from very different perspectives and talk them out. Uh, The episodes are out every Thursday. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to them on YouTube. This week, they talked to economist Blake Schaefer about getting Alberta's electricity grid sorted out. Here's a quick highlight. We, for the for the foreseeable future, need to have gas plants around that aren't providing, I don't like this notion of baseload. We do not need baseload. That's a our dinosaur term. What we need is flexible, dispatchable capacity. We need things that can come on and off really quickly and be there when we're in need for it. We don't really need the things that are running all the time. And I say that because we have this abundant wind and solar here. That is really, really cheap. It's a competitive advantage that Alberta has. So you want that to provide the bulk of your energy. And you want something else that's really nice and complementary to that, that can fill in the valleys. And something running flat out all the time is not that. What you want is the things that go up and down. Now, we can have some of that quote unquote base load because it's just moving the zero uh, if you will, it's just resetting what the uh, how what we're oscillating around. So some of it is acceptable for sure, but but that shouldn't be the primary focus. We want flexible things, and that's what I've I've my my argument with Environment Canada has been that the CER to me is too prescriptive. It, it dictates the number of hours you can run, has a specific end of life, whereas what I'd rather have a C is use that carbon price that we already have. Here in Alberta, we've got uh, political unanimity about it, oddly enough, Um, and that will drive a push towards cleaner things. But let us keep around that capacity that's already installed. You don't have to pay new capital costs for, and we can run them when when we need them. And it won't be run that often because you're paying a really exorbitant carbon price come 2030 to do so. So there you go. That's University of Calgary economist, Blake Schaefer in conversation with Erica Brutis and Cheryl Lotz. You got to hear their response to it, of course. That's one of the points of listening to that podcast. I love the note here from Sylvia, who says their recent interview with former Premier Allison Redford was actually very good. Sylvia enjoyed it. I appreciate you letting us know. You can subscribe to the Discourse wherever you get your podcasts and find them on YouTube as well. Fresh episodes out every single Thursday. I love this note here in the chat. Someone says, What's tomorrow's show going to be like? Is it a little more lighthearted? I thought today's was pretty lighthearted. I thought today's was pretty good. But Friday's Real Talk, you know, we present our roundtable. We're going to have three experts in here talking to you how to go green, how to turn your home around, and save money doing it all in the name of protecting planet Earth. I think it's going to be a great conversation, and I guarantee we're going to learn something. We'll talk to you then. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John